When it comes to most Pokemon speedruns, the goal usually revolves around grabbing a powerful Pokemon, beating up every trainer, then ending it all after a battle with the region's champion. But the Pokemon run we're talking about today takes the usual formula of speedrunning and adds a giant sea of collectibles on top of that initial goal to beat the game, which not only extends the final time of this speedrun by an extra four hours, but it transforms the concept of the original run entirely into what feels like a bunch Bunch of little side quests on a grand adventure and believe it or not two of those additional four hours will be spent trying to obtain a single megastone this my friends is the wild world of pokemon omega ruby and alpha sapphires mega stone speedrun to begin our journey of collecting Oros's 45 obtainable megastones, speedrunners will have to meticulously plan when is the best time to grab a megastone versus when you should be completing parts of the main story. And there's a lot of story to cover since most of the megastones will only be obtainable after beating both the main story and the Delta episode postgame. To add on to these complications, there's also a time-based megastone we'll have to try and fit into this crazy journey. So to start things off right, our story story will begin on the Nintendo DS's main menu. We'll need to first set the date and time to May 6 at 12 o'clock flat, pick May instead of Brendan to have an easier time on rival fights because of a minor difference in her starter Pokemon's nature, and finally, choose Mudkip as our first partner Pokemon of choice because it's simply the best starter Pokemon to use in a region where the only trainer you're required to fight in the game that can actually hit its evolutions for super effective damage is your rival. And now, we can finally move towards getting the very first megastone which is only obtainable after earning two gym badges while this might sound easy on paper getting past the first two gyms in an aura speedrun is a very massive mountain to overcome thanks to three of the hardest fights in the entire game being sprung upon us super early on the first of which is the fight to actually start playing the game since you only have about a 42% chance of obtaining speedrun viable mudkip stats due to RNG manipulation not being an option in this game. The second and third hurdles come from trainers that have a multitude of setup moves and ways to screw you over, while your only option to beat them is through clicking a move over and over again since stat buffing X items will not be available until after clearing these particular fights. One such case is located inside a pedal Woods in a battle versus a random Team Magma Grunt trainer with Sand Attack, Howl, and Tackle. I'm sure I don't have to tell you why that can overwhelm you pretty easily, but each runner of this game knows that any and all speedruns of Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire do not truly start until you've passed Black Belt Hideki of the Duford City Gym. Due to a programming error on this trainer's Pokemon, Hideki's Machop was given 28 IVs instead of 15 IVs on every single stat. He also has the perfect combination of Focus Energy to raise his critical hit chance and Low Sweep to lower your speed, which can easily overwhelm you into a completely unwinnable situation giving you at most three maybe four turns to survive and ko him and i imagine a lot of folks might be thinking why not just go into duford cave immediately deliver the letter to steven then travel to sleepboard city early while delaying the entire duford city gym for later like you could in the original ruby and sapphire well uh, this is an option in the remakes due to a bunch of folks standing in front of the spot where steven stone is located so uh good luck to speedrunners i guess but once we made our way past the Mount Everest levels of random trainer battles and easy gym leaders, we can finally breathe that salty ocean slateport air where the very first megastone of Alakazite is sitting inside of the marketplace. Unfortunately for the next megastone, it'll be about another hour to get to it. These things don't exactly grow on trees to be fair, so let's fast forward a bit after our arrival, three massive team magma story bits, and finally pass another three gym badges. Most of these fights aren't super crazy, but we will see a bit of difficulty on the fights on Mount Chimney as well as most of Norman's gym. But after completing those notable battles, you get free access to the HM for Surf, an extremely powerful move that for some reason was made into an HM. Unlike in the original games, the remakes will take a small detour to a distant island to tell a small story about Latios or Latios, depending on what game that we're playing. This is a good time to mention that most speedrunners have a preference towards Omega Ruby due to obtaining Latios instead of Latios, as well as the fact that Team Magma is incredibly weak to water moves from both Mudkip and Latios. 
And as fate would have it, Latios will want to be a member of our party after saving it from Team Magma, and we'll be holding on to a nice fancy Latios side to add to our small Megastone collection. Things will begin to rev up from here with some insanely fast Megastone pickups with Latios breezing through battles starting from Weather Institute and going all the way to Lily Cove City. The Weather Institute in particular will grant us access to cast form holding on to the amazing Mystic Water item both of which will be very important for our Megastone journey going forward. From here, if we start taking this very particular path towards Lily Cove, it'll grant us Swamperdite from Steven Stone, while he's handing us these crazy 3D goggles that let us get these invisible Kecleons. We'll also get a free Metachamite and Banetite on top of Mount Pyre as we battle our way through a bunch of Magma Grunts and Admins. But with those somewhat unremarkable Megastones out of the way, we can finally take a few baby steps towards that ridiculous two hour long journey for a singular stone that I mentioned earlier. The key to completing this crazy quest will be receiving and using a combination of cast form and what's known as cosplay Pikachu. But earning that cosplay Pikachu is unfortunately kind of a pain since it does require us to participate in a Pokemon contest. And oh man, do I hate these things. On paper, contests seem like a pretty neat feature since it's different enough from trainer battles, but I personally find them to be super misleading considering the crazy things they were allowed to do in the anime compared to this. But once we've completed at least one ranking of these contests, we can officially put them behind us and progress the last bit of the story remaining before the post game. The next Megastone quest has us going through and visiting Shoal Cave above Moss Deep after clearing out the Team Magma base. Shoal Cave in particular is a very fun little Megastone side quest that forces you to explore the cave at different time frames if you want to see and explore the entire thing. From the moment we arrive at Shoal Cave in the speedrun, we will experience the high tide version of it where most of the cave is flooded with water, requiring you to surf to reach the deeper depths of it in order to grab a bunch of shoal 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 shells. <clears throat> However, we will have to wait until low tide to come back and explore the rest of it in order to snag another two stone. But in the meantime, there's plenty of story to cover as we make our way into Tate and Liza's gym, surf them and our precious Marsh Dom to death, beat up Team Magma again underneath the ocean, save the world from Groudon with a Master Ball, then wipe the floor with the final gym leader, Wallace. Now I need to mention while we could have technically gone off to grab the next Megastone in between a lot of this, speedruns are all about optimization, and that optimization comes from the fastest way to get out of Sutopolis being to fly out of it. So we can just teach Latios fly, head over to Route 128, make our way slightly down to 127, and snag Heracronite on the way towards the Elite Four. As we've all come to know, the typical way to get to the Elite Four is through Victory Road, which has us dealing with quite a few annoying trainers. Most of which will be single battles, but there's also a slew of double battles that need to be avoided. For those unfamiliar with how to do that, the best way to do that ever since the invention of properly implemented overworld double battles back in Pokemon Emerald has been to only have one Pokemon in your party, or in our case, one Pokemon alive in our party. This is all thanks to the move Surf targeting every single thing on the field during the Tate and Liza battle, which lets us deposit everything but Marsh Stomp and Groudon to make it through Victory Road in as few battles as possible. The only truly notable battle here is Wally, but he doesn't even give us the Megastone for Gladeide, so who cares? But directly in front of the Pokemon League will be Mewtwo Knight Y rewarding us for our troubles. Much like our greedy, unnotable rival Wally, beating up the Elite Four and the champion Steven Stone will unfortunately not reward us with a Megastone at all. So to grossly oversimplify the Pokemon League battles, we'll start off by depositing every Pokemon in our party to get a shorter haul of fame sequence to play. Throughout a lot of these battles, we'll end up having to teach Groudon a ton of moves and swap items around depending on which Elite Four member we're facing. There's another good time to note that Glacia in particular is one of the reasons why speedrunners prefer Omega Ruby over Alpha Sapphire due to the fight being faster and safer through equipping the Red Orb in order for Groudon to become its primal form. This forces Groudon to get a massive stat boost and changes its ability to Desolate Land, which is a really broken ability. Because not only does it obliterate any attempt at changing the weather, but Glacia's AI doesn't know this, which forces her into this really weird loop where she spams hail over and over again while we just get to set up for free. 
And while you could technically do this for Alpha Sapphire, the reality is it's just slower for that game. But that's okay, because we're playing the good game Omega Ruby. The rest of the fights after Glacia aren't super crazy either, so all we have left to do is go through this massive 10 minutes of credits that we literally can't skip, and a post-credit rebel fight that we're actually allowed to lose on, giving us another reason to deposit our mons before taking on the Elite Four. And now that we finally got into the end of the main story, I'd like to say thanks for watching this far into the video. If you're enjoying this enough, consider subscribing. We're really close to 100,000, and it would seriously mean the world to me if you guys helped me out. But now, it's time for the Delta episode. For those unaware of what the Delta episode is, it's this really sick post-game Pokemon event where you need to save the world from a literal meteorite crashing into the planet. Because of this focus on the dangers of that space rock, the majority of the post-game requires you to go in and out of the space station on four separate occasions. So, a lot of the planning around the remaining 38 megastones becomes how many times can you minimize having to use fly? And I just want to say that that's more megastones than the entirety of Pokemon X and Y. So we got a lot to cover. Now to begin where we left off following the credits, a cutscene will trigger showing the people inside of the space station panicking as well as a full reveal of Lorekeeper Zinnia. Zinnia is a trainer who is incredibly important to the Delta episode story, truly embodying many of the what if scenarios. like. What if you could just steal the key items away from important NPCs? Wouldn't it just make things way easier than trying to save the world or grinding it all out on your own? This is straight speedrunning mentality right here, and she's easily one of my favorite side characters because of it. And it won't be long either before she reveals herself to us in very quirky weird fashion as we leave our house in Petalburg, are told that she straight up stole Brandon's keystone, then with a small trip to the bottom left of the town, we'll find Mewtwo Knight X. Luckily, the first destination to start triggering the Delta episode events is within biking distance, which is the best way to travel there due to us depositing our Pokemon before the Pokemon League. And we absolutely will need to grab them, so into the Pokemon Center we go before battling Team Magma admin Courtney, who is also trying to steal away a Keystone. Immediately after this fight, we'll end up getting a call from Steven Stone, who wants us to visit Devoncorp in Rustboro City. And given how close Rustboro is to four different Megastone locations, we'll need to cover those first inside of Rustsurf Tunnel for Agronite, a trip inside of a house in Verdanter for Gar Gardevoirite, a quick bike to the right of Verdanter for Mawalite, and a silly quest to find a little girl Shroomish. This Shroomish is actually so small that it's able to hide behind one of those signs in Verdanter, but once we found it, we can talk to the girl for an intriguing stone. The intriguing stone is actually not even that intriguing, however, since it's literally just a mega stone for Pidgeotite that needs to be identified by an expert who also happens to be the next NPC we talk to, Mr. Stone of the Devoncorp Corporation. This is actually also an important trip for the Delta episode, since we must first experience the great stone stare down that happens when you mash text fast enough. The TLDR of this is we end up finding out about a meteorite shard item required to push the events forward. As it turns out, Zinnia happened to snag this item while we were battling everyone on Mount Chimney. So, we need to venture to Granite Cave and confront her. Talking to her will almost immediately get us into a battle, where she'll send out a team of only Dragon-type Pokemon. And given how cracked out her mons are, this will be the best possible opportunity to sacrifice our teammates to avoid future double battles. However, losing entirely is not an option here, so we'll need Groudon to do their thing and sweep her. She'll then reward us with the Meteorite Shard, which gives off a mysterious green glow, hinting at more Delta Episode lore. But while we're here, we can't just leave without grabbing Steelixite at the bottom floor before escape roping out. And given how close we are to a place called Sea Mauville, or formerly Abandoned Ship in the original Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald games, we'll need to take a side trip for one of the first truly interesting post-game Megastones. This particular ship is really, really cool to explore but it's also filled with a ton of optional trainers. So we'll need to make sure that we don't hit them as we dive in and out of the water and talk to a very particular set of NPCs holding on to a secret set of keys. Then once keys one, two, four, and six are all found, we'll be given a storage room key for our troubles, which is holding a Beedrillite. Not sure why three and five are missing here either, but if I were to complain about skipping them, I don't think I could really call myself much of a speedrunner. Upon exiting the ship, we'll need to head to Moss Deep City Space Station to push forward the Delta episode. And then after a bit of lore drop, our favorite speedrunner, Zinnia, will ignore the lady blocking her path to deliver even more lore to us and give us information on where to go next. 
So first, we need to fly to Meteor Falls, go up a waterfall, obliterate My Hero Academia, ignore a double battle, listen in on an important conversation Steven Stone is having, and then we can finally grab another Mega Stone for Aerodactylite. Now you may be thinking, what about the intriguing stone? Well, as fate would have it, we're gonna need to fly back to Rustbro, which not only puts us into more Delta episode specific battles with Team Magma, but also has us turning our Groudon into an HM friend. Hey, a uh, future Pulse Effects here. Uh, turns out I was wrong throughout this entire section and I kept saying Groudon. Well, turns out it's just Latios that does this. Why does Latios learn the HM for cut? I mean, it's still the same thing, but like we use Latios to grab Scizorite. This, this is stupid. Quite a sad fate for a little dinosaur, but we'll be getting a more powerful Pokemon later anyways. For now, in typical Delta episode fashion, we'll need to head back to the space station, but this time to actually save it by playing dominoes. I, I mean, uh, it, stopping Team Magma, yeah. Uh, that's pretty much it though. We can just leave here after to use my favorite key item in the game, the Eon Flute. This thing not only has its own banger soundtrack to it, but it also lets you ride around on Mega Latios and encounter flocks of flying Pokemon in the sky. Normally, speedrunners would avoid running into encounters, but we're specifically looking for Swablu, since the Swablu located in the sky are really high level and can evolve through using a single rare candy. By then landing Latios back in Lily Cove and showing this dude an Altaria, he'll give us Altarianite and a nice opportunity to head inside of the Team Magma base. Once we've traveled far enough inside of the base, Zinnia will pop up out of nowhere, steal Maxi's keystone mid-conversation, then walk off like it was nothing. This will cause Maxi to straight up hand us his camera uptight, further cementing Zinnia as a true speedrunner. Now all the stuff to do in this area will be to run outside of the base since you can't use escape ropes, surf down to Route 124, dive up and down in the water in a specific spot for Pincerite, then fly off to Shoal Cave above Moss Deep City. And thanks to the time and date that we set at the beginning of the game, we can now enter Shoal Cave at what's known as low tide. Low tide completely shifts the way the cave is formulated and lets you explore the much deeper lower sections filled with ice. For speedrunning purposes, we want to grab at least four piles of shoal salt, then venture all the way to the bottom for Glaleite. If we need to escape our bout, re-enter the cave, then talk to the old man near the entrance, he will trade us the shoal, shoal, shoal salt and shoal shell <sighs> for a shell bell item and give us a free slowbro night for doing this. And now we've officially reached the halfway point on the Megazone speedrun count with about three more hours left in the speedrun. So bear with me as we approach the final bits of the Delta episode. We're first going to want to make our way into Moss Deep Space Station one last time for some direction from Stephen Stone. We'll then fly off to Sutopolis City for a chance encounter with Wallace, who makes a small mention of Sky Pillar before walking off. But that's not entirely why we came here, as Stable Knight can be grabbed after the Wallace discussion. Afterwards, we'll need to fly over to the closest route to Sky Pillar before taking a small detour into Pacific Log Town for Kangaskhan Eye before heading to Sky Pillar. Standing in front of Sky Pillar will be Wallace, who's packing a team so so cracked out that will be required to put the red orb on Groudon in order to handle him in the most optimal way possible. Then once the fight is over, we can begin to climb a much more lore heavy sky pillar than the original games had. And while I do love these nice cinematics, I really miss the thrill and challenge of biking over the cracks in the floor in the original games. I find it super weird that they don't even let you bike here for probably obvious reasons given how high up we are, but hey, these cutscenes are still pretty phenomenal, especially the ones that play once you've caught Rayquaza with a quick ball, beat up Zinnia with it, then put on a spacesuit and fly into space. While we can't exactly fulfill those playground rumors of going into space and seeing Deoxys on the moon and Pokemon Emerald, we at least get a really cool throwback to the original Deoxys event back in the Generation 3 games. The Deoxys fight, however, can be quite terrifying if you roll a bad nature on both Rayquaza and a good nature on Deoxys, since you would have to launch yourself back into space and watch this entire cutscene again if you somehow wipe. But that's something speedrunners risk anyways to try and one-shot Spaghetti Man, finish Delta episode, and unlock the rest of the Megastones. And now that the Delta episode is finished, we are unfortunately at the part of the run where most of the rest of the journey involves flying and grabbing stones non-stop. So let's do some nice fast summarization. Starting on Route 123 is the home of Gyaradosite, a Bomba Snowite, and a ton of berries that might just be the single most important resource for completing a 45 Megastone speedrun. More on that later. Mauville is kind of neat 
update, since it has a Lopinide as a reward for talking to the Pokemon FBI while also getting information from the gym leader Watson on the next Megastone. Manectite is also close by on the route south of Mauville, while Ampharosite is stuck inside of Old Mauville that can only be accessed by talking to Watson then going past the Manectite in the first place. Towards Mount Chimney, then inside Fiery Path, we'll find the TM for Toxic that'll also be important for later, next to Charizardite X, a flight into Mount Chimney's Jagged Pass lands us near Tyranitarite, and a trip south of Mount Chimney straight into Lava Ridge gets us Houndoomite. Four more of these Megastones will be found near Fall Arbor Town. Gladeite will be the first of these given for free inside of a house, while Blazikanite and Sceptileite need to be bought from an old man to the left of the town, then with a small flight near the entrance of Meteor Falls, we can get Salamensite before two more quick Megastone flights. These next two stones are particularly hard to chain together with other stones, so I'll have to sacrifice a bit of time flying to them separately. The first will be Venusaurite sitting on the ground on Route 118, and the second will be Charizardite Y inside of Scorch Slab on Route 20. And once we pick up Charizardite Y, that will mark one of the final boring flying bits of the run, meaning we now have no choice but to finally commit to the nasty two-hour Megastone. So this begs the question as to why exactly does it take two entire hours to get this Megastone? Well, it's all because we have to enter and successfully win in every single contest rank until we've reached and beaten the final ranking master rank on all of them. This particular stone is also one of the reasons why speedrunners eventually invented the 44 Megastone speedrun just to avoid this one. Once again, this begs the question of why didn't we do the rest of the contest if we could actually just you know, do them all in a row while competing in the first contest with cast form. Well, just like the earlier stones, the answer to that is optimization, but also a bit of consistency. The thing is, while you could try and compete in this contest with just straight up going in with cosplay Pikachu, the amount of prep that speedrunners do to compete in these contests in the first place is extremely important. Because even with the prep that we do, sometimes we can't help but actually end up losing some of these rankings. So while we would have liked to complete this entire thing in one go, all we could really do is use the most consistent Pokemon for a contest, being cast form for beauty contest, to at least try and have everything ready for later. Either way, we would have had to come back to Slateport for the last couple of Megastones, so this ends up kind of working out anyways. And speaking of cracked out Pokemon for contests, let's talk about cosplay Pikachu. While contest judges go absolutely crazy for this thing, as I just stated, it's not enough just having it and using it. Because in order to even stand a chance of reaching master rank in a contest, we need to make what's known as Pokeblocks. Pokeblocks are essentially the vitamins of the contest world since they raise your Pokemon's contest stat with each block that you feed it. In total, there are 12 different types of Pokeblocks that exist in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, but only two of them will be relevant for speedrunning purposes, which are the Rainbow Pokeblock and the Rainbow Pokeblock Plus, which is just a better version of the Rainbow Pokeblock, but with sprinkles. I don't know why they made both of them. But what's important to note is that Rainbow Pokeblocks essentially raise every single contest stat at the same time and rate, making them way more valuable than the single colored ones that only raise a single stat point at a time. We'll need at least three out of four Pokeblock sets to be Rainbow Plus according to the speedrun notes. So we'll usually just save before making the blocks and reset until we meet that requirement. And what's even more fortunate about us playing the remake is that the Pokeblock making process has been simplified a ton since the original games to the point where we only need to throw in four differently colored berries, and we're at the very least guaranteed to get rainbow Pokeblocks without putting much thought or effort into the blending process. From here, every single Pokeblock that we made that's a rainbow Pokeblock plus or regular is fed straight into the contest Pikachu. Once this first bit of torture is over, we can then show off the fully decked out cosplay Pikachu to the Pokemon fan club president. He'll give us a multitude of colored scarves that increase the effectiveness of contest moves when held by a Pokemon. Then finally, after those three minutes of prep out of the way, we can dive into participating in all of the glorious contests. We'll start off with the cute contest since Pikachu is already dressed up by default to take on this specific category. What I mean by that is this special Pikachu contains unique moves based off of the cosplay that it's wearing and having this specific pink dress on gives it draining kiss. 
a super powerful cute move that crushes contests. Each time one of these contests starts, we'll have the opportunity to press a button to skip an animation that plays to save time on the parts where contestants show off their Pokemon. Then as soon as we're past the cutscenes, we can finally pick one of four moves for Pikachu to appeal to the judges and crowd, earning bonuses if you use a move that matches the contest category that you're participating in. The general strategy we use in these contests is to swap between different moves in order to either stop other certain Pokemon from earning excess points or to not get penalized for spamming the same move over and over again. Those excess points are usually earned on the exact same turn that a fifth star is filled in on the star gauge through using a move that matches the contest category, making so that whoever earns that fifth star during the contest will get a very big amount of bonus points and do a really weird Z move to earn even more points than usual. However, earning that fifth star is very much up to chance since the opponent can just sometimes decide not to use a move that matches the contest category, which will cause the star gauge to go down by one out of nowhere. And good lord, don't even get me started on some of the effects of these moves. Let's just say that moves like Hyper Beam are super broken, but overall, all we can really do most of the time is hope and pray that we're the ones to fill in that fifth star. As for the amount of time synced into this, in total, each contest takes around 20 to 30 minutes to reach and beat Master Rank, depending on how lucky we are during the lower and higher rank contest. To sort of add on to that time sync, we need to talk to an NPC in between rounds in order to change the costume on Pikachu before participating. But even after all five master rank contest categories are completed, you still need to beat the contest idol Licia to earn this elusive Megastone, which is incredibly stressful since she essentially plays like the champion of the contest world. And to be quite honest, all you can really do to fight her contest power is to try and make it so that she doesn't earn that fifth contest star at any point in her time, or you're incredibly likely to lose. But once you do lock in that win, this blonde dude who gaslights you throughout your entire contest journey will finally reward you with Lucario Knight. But here's the thing, we're not done with the stones just yet, as we have about five more stones to grab before the end of the run. So before we completely wrap up, I need to make an honorable mention of two mega stones that are not included in this speed run. The first of which is Deonsite. This stone in particular can only be received online during a period of time that has since passed, so we can't exactly include it in the total. And finally, the Garchompide that is even harder to get it than the contest stone. Garchompite is unfortunately not very speedrun friendly due to having to earn what is known as base flags, and you need 1,000 of them. And from what I can tell, these base flags not only have a daily limit on how many you can randomly receive, but they also seem to require you to go through some online features. Uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong in the comments on this, by the way, because I couldn't really find much information on if this was true or not. But even without these online features in mind, this stone would probably add a bunch of extra days of time to the run and probably make it a lot less interesting than it already is. Luckily, that's not the case, however, and we could just spend more time worrying about other stones like Blastoiseite. Blastoiseite happens to be located on the SS title that can only be accessed through the boat dock in the post game by having a certain ticket. And since we're already in Slateport for the contest, going to the docks, getting on the ship, then heading to the front deck of the ship to grab Blastoiseite is a no-brainer. From here, all we have to do is sleep to end the ship's journey instantly before we get back onto the boat since we need to head over to the battle resort for the next Megastone. Then as soon as we disembark, we are instantly given Sharpedoite for free by Team Aqua. While we're in the battle resort area, we need to trigger the extremely short Looker encounter for another Megastone. He kind of just trips on the beach and then heads off to a house, but on the way there, there also happens to be a Gengarite in a nearby cottage. Then by talking to him one last time, we'll get the second to last Megastone, Odin. Tonight. The final stone we can now get our hands on is Metagrossite, and this is where Mega Rayquaza will finally get to shine since we'll need to take on the harder second round of Elite Four members to get it. Not only are they packing high enough levels on their original teammates to match Rayquaza's level, but they also add a couple of new teammates as well as a guaranteed Mega Evolution on their team. Some of which include Mega Absol, Sableye, Glalie, Roaring Moon, and the final one, Mega Metagross. A lot of these fights will heavily depend on your Rayquaza stats and nature, and you could easily die to any one of them at a moment's notice. But with the combination of Bulk Up, Dragon Dance, Dragon Pulse, Waterfall, and Dragon Ascend, the Elite Four Round 2 can be as simple as smashing moves, ending the Omega Ruby 45 Megastone speedrun with a world record of 7 hours, 
20 minutes and 5 seconds by my friend the 4th gen gamer. While the 44 megastone speedrun is done in 4 hours, 56 minutes and 8 seconds by my other friend Thomas Patrick. Crazy just how much a single megastone can make such a big difference.